Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be connecting with you all this evening or morning or afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, I am with Anush from Burnley. Hello, Anush. Welcome. Hey. Well, uh, thank you so much, David. <laughs> It's a pleasure to be joined with you. We were talking before about her amazing background there. I'm liking the pink. Uh, it's looking very, very cool. There's a flamingo that might pop up at some point during today's webinar. So, you know, maybe we'll make that like a, you know, if you spot the flamingo, dial in and you can win a prize. And we are talking about some interesting things today. So let me just first give you guys some background. Anush runs a company called Burnley. And, um, you know, you guys really focus on uh, storytelling, but through the medium of video, right? I think that's, is that a fair way to, to frame it? Um, and we connected a couple of weeks ago and we were chatting about this whole topic and we thought, you know what, this is a great topic to share. Um, and so that's kind of why we're here. Uh, I, I was totally excited, honestly, when David suggested me to talk about this topic because like branding is the most important thing, I think, for every company and telling it through video is like the best way. So I think we're going to talk and cover about this a lot today. Okay, amazing. So what we decided to, to just talk to Anush about and, and pick your brain about ready is kind of how to tell a brand story. Um, and maybe we can even start with, you know, what that is. Um, so, you know, let's maybe ask uh, a quick question just to kind of um, set the tone here. Does a brand even need a story? You know, what is a brand story? Uh, that's an amazing question because like without a story, without a brand story, like let's say company is very plain and it doesn't have any personality because like branding is all about like having aesthetics and having a vision and sharing that vision with your clients because like brand story is the only way to actually engage the clients and make them to really want to buy from you, but not like just selling them something. It's like telling them something emotional and connected that emotions with what they have in their mind, what they have in their, let's say, body, what, what they are feeling. And just like, that's the only way actually to connect it with your company. Because um, usually people trust people, not the brands, but, but with the brand story, you connect that connection of the trust between your company and your audience. Yeah, I think those are such good points. I mean, firstly, all, all people like stories, right? Every culture on earth has stories that, that we all grew up hearing. And, you know, stories, as you said, create emotional connections. And um, often, you know, personifying a brand and making it, you know, like it, like a human, like something that you can feel really passionate about is the ultimate goal of every marketer, you know? And, um, you know, just talking about a few things like that. I mean, some companies that are already good examples, um, I know we were chatting before, um, you know, we've got on screen here, KFC is an example, Coca-Cola is an example, um, Apple, of course, is an example. Are there any brands that you personally feel tell a story really well that you like really connect with? Uh, honestly, there are a lot of companies that create their brand story that you really got excited about it. One of the things is definitely one of the companies, definitely Nike, because they really make that story of athletes and create that emotions that people like every people who are not athletes, who are not like sport people, they really want to wear Nike just because of like their heroes are wearing that. So this is also a really good way of telling a story like connecting people with their fans, uh, connecting brands with their fans, and also like uh, cre creating some connections of the story, like Coca-Cola does for the Christmas. Usually like everybody knows like for Christmas, there is a relation with Coca-Cola. Like it's so connected to together. And that's the way they connected this story. And people started to get a lot of engagement with it. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, if I just think of KFC, my immediate thought goes to like the family bucket and everything there seems to be about family. You know, that's the thing you see land on the screen in slow motion and the chickens just kind of, you know, bouncing around. Um, Apple, Apple is like, they may be even gone more than just telling a story. They've created a culture. There's a certain they did. Type, you know, person, right? Um, you know, for, for the Apple, like the story starts from very, very far because like, 
Apple is all about innovation, right? So the idea of Newton sitting under the tree and being like the apple falls in on her on his hand and he discovers the gravity, this innovation they connected with their brand. Nowadays, maybe not a lot of people know like from where comes this story, but when they started it and connected that line together, people started to be so involved with it. And the the good stuff is nowadays like. Apple is very, the most famous fruit, I would say. But in some cases, when you say apple, you first understand the bread and then the fruit in some mm. And that's phenomenal, honestly, like how they can build that connection with their branding, their name, with association of anything. Yeah, so true. Um, do you, do, you know, when you're trying to think of creating that kind of identity, is that something that you can only think about once your company's much more established or is that something you have to have a good sense of from the day that you kind of get started and you know, start putting yourself out there? Uh, I would say the story, the brand story starts from the very, very beginning, like in a very first step when you start thinking about having your product or your service. Um, but the thing is that in some cases, the story can get better and better each year, each, each day. Like Coca-Cola doesn't start it with Christmas um, right. connection. They started maybe in different way. And then during the time they realized like when people do like to drink Coca-Cola. So, and then that's how like they started to build that brand. So I would say we are starting branding process in a very first stage, but we can always uh, change it. We can change our stories. We can create new stories. We can create new real emotions with the people. Yeah. And do you think that the identity of a company um, is built in the beginning or it's something that like that story shapes over time? So, you know, there are uh, it, like I can I can think of examples of either right where like let's say Red Bull. Right? Yeah. Red Bull was always known for pushing the edge. Right. It's not like they started as like a hey, they're just a calm, you know, a regular group of people and then suddenly they became extreme. So, you know, how do they, I just would love your take on that. Like how do, how do people start to wrap their heads around that? Um, I would say it really depends on, because like it depends on the some campaigns as well, like how soon you start that campaign and how soon this campaign can go viral. That's the only way actually to get that emotions from your audience. But it also depends on like, is this company like B2C, like Coca-Cola and KFC, like everyone use it, or is this B2B company? Because with B2B companies, it's a bit difficult to create your story and get that emotions. And there are maybe few b2b companies that can get the same like reaction and uh, let's say fame as can have b2c companies so it's a bit different but at the same time i know that um for b2b's like if you can create the story even between your target audience who could be a more smaller group it's already a win for you yeah i think you know you're touching on another really important point which is your target audience I mean, that ultimately should help you frame the story. If you're telling a story to kids, it's a very different kind of story than if you're telling it to adults. And I would imagine if you're, you know, if you are a um, B2C, as you said, product that's selling to 18 to 25 year olds, you have a completely different audience than if you are a B2B cybersecurity company that's pitching to, you know, CISOs and CTOs. Totally, totally. And I would say like besides the uh, target audience, like there are a few questions that you should always ask yourself before creating your brand story. And the first one is always like, who are you? Because like you first, to do, you have to understand who you are. What's your story? What's your real story? Like why you have decided to create this product in the first place and understanding like, what do you do? Like, okay, what's, what's my product actually? And then and then discuss about who do you do it for. So it's kind of like question by question, you have to like understand your actual brand story and then build the one that you can present to the world. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, even just coming to things like logos and colors, um, yeah. a lot of people, you know, kind of sit on two sides. There are people that they believe that this is the most important thing ever and they will spend more time on this than anything else. And there are people that believe it's like a complete waste of time, 
right? Mm-hmm. Like, hey, let's just get going. Don't worry about the colors. Don't worry about the logo. So, you know, I can imagine good arguments for both, but I'm just curious about your take. So that, that's a really good uh, thing to talk about because, like, I realize that a lot of people think that branding is all about logo and the name, but it's not. Like, it's it's just an item. It's just like, just one side of the branding. And in some cases, um, just concentrating on the logo and uh, on, the, on the name will not give people that emotions. Uh, it's important, of course. It's just, a, like, one item that you have to have. But uh, during the time, like, your logo could be changed you can make it more modern during the process so it's something that's changing but the brand story uh, I mean like the actual vision that you have in your mind for your branding is not changing at all like you always start with the same family mood like coca-cola one day is not becoming something different than for the families it still stays the same maybe the brand message is changing a bit so um, I would say logo even it's not that important rather than the other things that you associate with the item. For example, in the KFC's case, if you just like close the logo, you can still see that uh, thing. Like even, I don't know, one chicken can yeah. can be, it, it is so famous, like without even logo. And the same for Coca-Cola, like you, you close it, but everyone knows it. So, um, and and for the Apple as well. So I, 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 I think people need to understand that the branding doesn't start with the logo, but it's also important. Like the brand name is also so important because I, I always say like you can change everything in your branding, but not the name and not your brand colors. These are two factors that I would never suggest you changing. You can change the palettes of the colors, but... Um, if you decide like fully going from the orange to the blue, people not recognize you anymore after that. So that's why we realize that a lot of brands are not making this kind of uh, very, let's say, um, like big dramatic. changes. Yeah. yeah, dramatic changes. The most famous example that I learned about in university was the new Coke example, mm-hmm. right? Where Coke decided for no reason or whatever to completely reinvent their logo yeah. and it, i think it's known as one of the biggest marketing failures um you know i know pepsi did, a, did that before google's done that there's a lot of companies that have like a really well established logo changed it and get you know got absolutely um <clears throat> hammered by their consumers because of that um yeah yeah but, that's yeah. true <laughs> now let's talk about the heart of brand storytelling um you know, we were spending a lot of time, you know, just say, you know, talking about emotions. Um, mm-hmm. Emotions can mean a lot of things. You know, you can feel emotional about a lot of things. Um, I guess my question to you is, well, what kind of emotions should I be trying to get my audience to feel about my brand? You know, what are acceptable emotions that I should be kind of trying to tap into? Uh, you know, I would say it's so different for each brand. Like there is no like such thing that each brand should have these 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 emotions because like each of them it depends on the target audience as well like in some cases people can feel loved people can feel um, power people can feel some other stuff which are not even like in the same level and that's that's depends on the product that depends on the target audience the age of the audience like everything is different for every person like even in some cases the negative emotions could be also a thing to showcase in your brand because that can also encourage people to do some stuff to buy your product. So this is really something that everybody have to just think for themselves and understand like which emotions I really want to evoke in people when they watch and when they hear about my story. Yeah, I think there's, you know, um, some good examples there um, that just spring to mind. One for me is Ryanair low cost airline often marked for you know charging for every little thing and they lean right into that in their social media i mean i think i saw a post from them once on it was either instagram or tiktok about it was like a joking post that they're going to charge people to to use the bathroom you know <laughs> um and and it's just like so funny and it's, and because they lean in and make a joke about it, yeah we know that like we're like this, right? <laughs> People like you kind of can't hate them for that thing anymore, you know, because uh, the so that I thought that was brilliant. Another one that I, I just think is like such a 
a, a classic is Avis um, with the We Try Harder as their slogan. Yeah. That is such an emotional thing that everyone can relate to. It's like it's almost like saying like, hey, yeah, there might be someone better or bigger or whatever, in the, but we try harder. And everyone out there is trying their hardest, right? So you can connect to that so well. Um, those are two that like straight away just come to mind in what you're saying. Uh, honestly, I I totally... Uh, I, I totally agree with you because like in Ryanair's case, like even though people know like it's the cheapest airlines like they can fly with, they sometimes wait for some luxury stuff <laughs> and and that's just expectation. Like everyone wants that. But if they already in the beginning try to explain in a funny way that what people can expect from them, people started to be okay with that. Like it's 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 the same as real normal human relationship when you tell pe person like what to expect from you they usually don't expect more of that so this is a really good way of how to make your audience i think uh really know what to expect from you and what to get from you yeah i also i found even on a sales level um being able to be very clear about who who you want to connect with and who you don't want to connect with also builds a lot of trust and it's, i think it's also quite useful for brands in some ways to to separate people or even polarize or like or, you know separate out an audience with that kind of emotional you know there are some that are like very you know very soft and romantic let's imagine that's the emotion that might completely put off a whole a whole genre of people um mm -hmm. or let's coming back to red bull you know i doubt you know a, a grandparent is going to be interested in red bull but they're not pitching to them right they don't want you know, a, a grandfather or grandmother who's watching someone jump out of an airplane is not thinking, oh, my God, I want to do that. I want to drink, a, <laughs> well, at least not most, right? So I think that that also is super powerful to be able to frame your audience by how you want them to feel about what you're doing. Um, yeah. We spoke about things like slogans. We spoke about logos. Um, I think it's also just worth touching uh, on video. So you're obviously, you know, you're a video expert, why do you think, you know, why? Firstly, how did you get into the whole video thing? What what inspired that? <laughs> and why do you think it, it's a, a good medium for kind of telling that brand story? Actually, like the uh, process of how we got involved in the video first place was is, is part of our brand story. That's, uh, that's because like we really wanted to share like how we got in love with video and how we can make people got, get involved with the video. That's that's everything that relates to our brand story in this moment. And I, I would say why. So the video is the only content that involves all the other contents together. Like we're talking about text, image, audio, movement, all together in one content. Like people are going to see it, hear it, like they're going to get it, like all together. That's why like there is no power way to, do, to deliver your message rather than with the video. Yeah. And um, I feel like the branding with video, telling your brand story with video is the most powerful way. Cause like you can, um, you, you can really deliver the message the easiest way. Uh, you can uh, create that film look, the, the movie look that people are going to really be interested to watch. Cause like if you, if we know like everybody will, loves watching movies, right? You can just sit down, don't think about anything, just watch it. And the same things happens when people watch your brand movie. So it's the same, like you should think about the video as the brand movie for yourself and for your story. Um, and, you know, there is actually some really great tips of how to create your brand story in the video. And the things that you have to really take into account is building the very strong arc from the very beginning of your video to the very end. Cause like, it's important how you get started, like how you make them engage. Even first, like three to 10 seconds are so important for people to be engaged and then start uh, thinking about the rest of then start being engaged to watch the rest of the video that you have. And that connection, even like the ending of the video, like this call to action that you encourage people to do something, all is so important in the video creation process. 
I would also say that in every video, you have to have some kind of lovable characters. They not necessarily have to be live characters. Sometimes they could be like animated characters, but each personality when you have that you can always have a better connection with your audience that's one of the things you have you talk about the mascot um, that we have uh, so I would say that in uh, in every branding uh, if you want to be different from your um, target audience you should find something that could make it so memorable for you and for us for example like we have this flamingo and we have also flamingo in our website uh, for people who could who could be interested to connect with us, and we so associate this, uh, let's say, item with us. So people know exactly like Bernoulli. It's the flamingo. It's our mascot. It's our unicorn in some cases. Uh, so um, because of the color, first of all, and because of the creativity, because I, for me, flamingo is the most creative animal in the world planet. So th that's how you make some kind of a connection with your audience so they will remember you in the first place when they see something related to you yeah a hundred percent i mean um we thought the same when we named our company whistle uh it's a name that you remember and also once we you know once you understand what we do it it all comes together right so, yeah. oh whistle whistles get attention that's what that's what you know that's what we're doing right we do sales development we're we're um, getting people's attention and it almost sounds like we sell which is kind of also what we do um, but yeah it does play a lot into it and and I agree I mean our logo our logo is a whistle shape so um, yeah. <laughs> I, I agree and, and it does it stays in people's minds uh, for sure and and helps them feel a certain way um, you know I also want to just come you know talking about us as well uh, thinking about the audience point that we raised before yeah, we our main audience are already marketing and sales professionals and leaders, and they are more likely to be creative, um, expressive. Um, a lot of them aren't necessarily uh, always extroverts. They could be introverts too. But you can be quite um, out there as a brand and still be seen as like um, completely appealing. You know, if we were selling to like accountants, for example. There's a lot of things on our site, like even little humorous things. Like if you scroll over our team, uh, our images, like we all change and we're doing something else. Um, you couldn't, we wouldn't be able to do that, you know. So I, I can totally relate to everything that you're saying, and I've seen that you know play out in what we do as well. Um, so for sure, um, let's talk about this target audience. So how does a company even think about who their target audience even is? How do you know who your target audience is? I think in the first stage, it's so difficult to from the to understand who is the target audience. You may go like in more wide version, but if you like narrow down your target audience and try to work with the niche market, that would be much much easier. Because like there are some products like everybody can say like, oh, this is for everyone, but it should not be. Not because like everybody can't buy it, everybody can buy it, but in some products, when you like narrow down into like, I don't know, one gender, narrow down into one um, age, you can find better and find, uh, create your story in a better way. Because in that case, you can like imagine this persona, understand like their needs, understand what they are expecting from you, and then create your story based on that. So it's thinking from the client's perspective is the first thing and if you take like wider audience it would be so difficult to think because like there are different people and they are thinking differently but uh, in a niche market people usually think in the same way and usually have the same needs i agree and i i also think that um exactly like to that point uh i always tell that also to our clients you know when we work on and setting up meetings for them and helping them grow their business, that if you can get ready specific about who you're selling to, it makes it a lot easier. And, you know, a lot of our clients are technology companies and they really have two audiences that they're um, approaching all the time. The first is their investor audience. And the second is their actual customers or potential customers. And those two, the stories that they tell those two don't align for a long time. So, for example, when you're just starting out, um, you want to tell the investors the biggest story possible, 
that your target mm -hmm. audience is the widest thing possible and demonstrate that the scale and growth of their investment is, you know, almost unlimited. Yeah. When you're talking to the customer, you need them to feel like you are specifically built for them and you understand only their world and you're really, really deeply entrenched. And, th and that way you can win off both audiences. And I think that that's like so true because if you get those mixed up, you go to the invest and say, you know, we, we help uh, the specific tiny little niche group. They're not interested. And if you go to the customer yeah. and say, well, we're amazing for everyone. We can do everything, <laughs> right? They can't relate to you either. Uh, honestly, that's the same thing that we did for our company. We went with two niches. First, we went only by creating videos because it's also niche like there are a lot of marketing companies who do videos as well but we decided to go only on video creation and besides that we decided to go only with the tech companies and even got more into deep like choosing only software companies to work with like more SaaS companies or AI companies and that helps us a lot in the first hand because when any of our audience members, like someone, an AI company who just like um, launch a, a platform comes to us, they trust us more because they know like we're specialized in the, their industry. They know exactly like whom to address, what to do, because we work with the with these kind of companies a lot. But if we had wider audience, like imagine we're working with, I don't know, a uh, alcoholic brands and then like having shoes company like no one would understand like what's our specialization in any case like because they are so different like even video creation for shoes are different from the it a lot different yeah and i think for us you know when when we started um you know i didn't have the idea to start a company and then find the customer the customers came and then I started trying to navigate my way through which customers were I actually, you know, a good fit for me mm. and I for them and the other way around. I'm sure a lot of people probably have the same story. Um, so, you know, three years later or a little bit more than three years later now, I feel much more comfortable about who I'm a really good fit for and who I'm not a really good fit for. Um, yeah. And I think that it's, it's really important. Like the, the sooner you can figure that out, you can save yourself a lot of pain and suffering. Um, and there are plenty founders out there that start a company and aren't sure who they sell to. And, you know, I have to agree with you on that. Like it, it just makes it so much easier if you can get to that answer pretty quickly. Let's talk about how to create this story. So we were talking <laughs> about, you know, video as one medium. Um, who's involved in that whole process? You know, like when I look at my company, do I just attribute that to the marketing team and say, hey, marketing team, go tell our story? Or is that something that I need to consider, you know, other people uh, in my company as, as part of? Um, you know, I always suggest like creating a story with the full company and even like outside of the company. Because like when you are founders or executives of the company, you have some visions in your mind that may be different from your target audience. Because in some cases, you may not even be part of your target audience. And when you include the other team members and like even your clients outside of the company to be involved in this creation process, you can have have like full understanding of what people think about this and what people actually want. So I usually suggest uh, actually to like get together with the full team members outside of the office usually in a very calm atmosphere and start uh, talking about different stuff which can actually be related to your brand because um, your any of your employees can have something in their mind and can create some kind of a stories, can share with you like what they think about it. And all of this together, when you start brainstorming together, you can build a very, very powerful story that can work for any case, like it work for any audience. I think just on that point, which is um, something I only learned recently, is also the, the, um, the value of internal branding. Yeah. And getting, you know, it's helped us with recruiting the right people and creating a specific kind of culture around, um, you know, our brand and our company. And, uh, you know, we created, uh, we've got like video testimonials from our team of what it's like to work at, at Whistle. And to, you know, to the credit of the human resources team that we have and, 
and really the company that we have, there's a lot of examples of people who um, have left and then come back. And the main reason for coming back is they actually just missed working with us. They missed the team. They missed the culture. And that to me is always like such a great and healthy sign, you know? So I think like, you know, we're always so focused on like, let's tell everyone else our story, but we need to tell ourselves that story as well. Of course, of course, definitely. Uh, I think branding, not only for customers, it's definitely for team members. It's definitely for your employee branding. Uh, and I love actually how people react in some cases to the brandings. I'll be honest, like in Armenia, uh, men are not so much in love that our branding is in pink. <laughs> And that's, that's, that's so crazy. Like we even had uh, during our hiring process, a person that asked, why you made it pink? I really want to work with you, but, <laughs> but I don't want to work in a pink company. <laughs> so, but, but when, um, as we're hiring mostly internationally, it's so, so much easier because like <laughs> outside they, of it, like people are not thinking in the same way. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, we actually went through a bit of a color uh, update as well i originally chose like pink black white and i think like canary yellow as the colors because to me that was like in your face colors yeah. um but <laughs> our segment has really changed like who we're going after has changed so in the beginning we were much more like early stage scrappy and we're going for early stage and scrappy customers now we work we would still work with a lot of those but really our focus is really shifted on companies that are a bit more established and and therefore we've got a bit more gone a bit more corporate i guess in at least in the branding so yeah i totally relate and it's funny how little things like a color can impact on whether people want to work with you as a customer or even an employee yeah it's it, it's very funny but you know like um why we choose this color that's very important because like when we were getting started one of the companies t-mobile um which like very known telecom company is actually using something similar. They, they have like coral mostly as a color, main color. And I love their branding. It's something that like really excites me, especially like when I see like their CEOs, both their CEOs, like this one and the previous one, they're so active on social media, create a lot of bunch of videos and they are so greatly doing video marketing. So we got very excited and decided we, we want something bright as they do. Like that's, that's how like you get that involvement of people and understanding like these are going to make an impact on people because they are going to be so bright effect maybe on them as, as T-Mobile was for us. Yeah, so true. Um, now, you know, not everything is going to go great in your business. I mean, uh, two examples that I can think of uh, that both involve sports and both involve soft drinks are uh, number one, the very famous uh, scene where Ronaldo sits down at the press conference, takes the Coca-Cola off the table and puts water instead. Um, I believe that that cost them like, you know, billions of dollars or something like Definitely. that, right in the stock value. Um, and there's a similar one with uh, in the UFC um, where I, I think it's Israel Adesanya who um, was the former... Uh, champion, um, you know, he's knocked over a monster energy drink. Um, mm. You know, he just knocks it off the table. So, you know, those kinds of things obviously can have a huge impact on your brand in a negative sense. Having said that, I'm still talking about it, right? And uh, and I don't drink monster energy, but I definitely drink, you know, Coca-Cola. Um, so, yeah, I was just wondering, like, you know, what does a brand do when there's negatives out there? Um when there's negative stories out there about their brand, how do they ben how do they you know navigate that? Is there a way to turn that into a positive? What's your take? You know, they said like even bad PR is a PR because like we're right. going to talk about it. And in some cases, I know that it could have like huge revenue decrease. But if the brand is clever, if they sit down and think about a strategy of how to get the most amount, most about most out of it it could be very very helpful because i realized in some cases like they had very bad let's say reputation because of some stuff but like even when they just when they are on social media and apologize for the things they did it can change a lot like recently the balenciaga's case like 
everyone was talking about it and I was like okay they are going to close like no one is going to buy anymore but like they started to like publicly apologize about it and like people started to okay maybe they just did mis mistake like there wasn't anything like behind it so I think like people first of all the brands need to be very honest in these cases and think about like a strategy to make their bad opinion into very very positive one uh, like switch it and it's so easy it's rather easy make the negative into positive than not having any kind of story at all and not being heard at all so uh, I feel like in any case people brands need to be prepared for these kind of cases yeah I mean I was just thinking of another one um, just from personal experience when I last bought I think it was my iPhone um, and it came without a charger oh. and I was like <laughs> where's the charger and the sales rep at Apple the Apple genius I believe they call themselves uh, said yeah. to me um, we don't do this anymore uh, yeah. for environmental reasons because mm. we have a huge commitment to the environment and there's a big ad that just came out you know with Apple and uh, Mother Earth is visiting them and I was like you're not doing this because it's going to save you probably millions of dollars because now you don't have to do that and I have to buy a charger yeah. right I still need a charger it's not like yeah it's charging via the sun so I think that's like such a clever twist on the story someone's like hey we don't want to pay for these charges anymore but how can yeah. we get out of this in a way that no one can argue because I'm not going to say to him like I don't care about the environment. Give me my charger. <laughs> You're not. Right? So, like, yeah, you know, that, that's, that's a smart that's, move. They are so clever, honestly. I can't say, like, who – sometimes, like, we can wonder, like, who is behind Apple in any case because it's not just one person. We definitely know. But they are doing marketing in a very, very, very clever way. Yeah. yeah. I think um, there's another good example um, – you know, there's a, a huge uh, Netflix series, uh, Drive to Survive, which is like behind the scenes of the Formula One. And yeah. Formula One for the longest time has been a sport that you've only really got diehard fans. And then, you know, no one else really cares, right, about watching cars go round and round and round for hours. But Drive to Survive revealed a whole element of Formula One that many people had no clue was happening, which is this dr this drama emotion yeah. backstabbing uh you know all these deals and and to the point that like my wife is a huge fan she couldn't care about you know formula one until <laughs> until that came out and now like we've watched every episode of every season and i know a lot of people that um myself included that are like engaged now in formula one because they actually revealed all these like ugly bits that you know normally you would have never known as just a tv audience you would never know all that drama yeah tv shows is also a really great way to tell a story like a lot of companies does that like making reality shows making some competitions which actually mm, people are going so be engaged about this and they're going to remember the brand because